tumultuous? <laughs> Talking to a couple of people a while ago, and they said, are you having a good day? And he said, well, I'm having a day. He said, but I'm vertical. So it makes a good day out of it, doesn't it? But we're glad that you're with us this morning. I don't know, folks. I don't know how long I'm going to be able to do this. That smell coming out of that room over there. Mm, mm, mm. Thank you for shutting the door. <laughs> what, the, the, the talking from out there? Okay. Well, we're glad that you're with us. And I tell you what, and by the smell that going on in that back room, if you don't stay and eat with us, it's your foolishness that's being demonstrated because it sure does smell good. And I know what Kathy brought. <clears throat> oh, I hope you don't like her stuff because I sure do. But, <laughs> but here we go from here, if you would, please. All right, let's look at, we're in if he, uh, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And the more I look at this, my opinion, my understanding of the book of Philippians is changing a little bit. I, I'm encouraged tremendously by this book. Because you know what I see today when I look at this book? Today's church. Full of all the weaknesses and all the problems and all the shortcomings that this congregation did. It fits us beautifully. And, but, you know, it's not the same problems that Corinth had. Corinth had problems that were, oh, awful. But here in Philippi, they had, well, it's kind of hard to explain. But it was a problem, but mainly because of what we're going to discuss today. We're going to start with verse 5, but I want to go through the first four verses just to kind of set the pace. If you would please, before we get into it, let's bow together. Our Father, we do thank you and, and, ask, and so thankful for your blessings that you give us every day. We know that your goodness and your love for us is far more than we can understand. We're so thankful, Father, that we have the time we can come together as your children, and we pray, Father, that as we study from this book of Philippians, that it will affect the way that we think, affect the way that we do things, and affect the way that, that our attitude will change. Bless us now, be with each one of us today, and may the things that we say, may the things we do truly glorify you and help us, Father, to be better uh, stewards in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay. As Paul is writing this chapter 2, I know he's talking about his situation. I can make my joy complete. But folks, when we're looking at these things here in chapter 2, the first four verses, Every one of these can clearly be described, this belong to Jesus. These are characteristics that you can see in him very, very clearly. And then when we see that, and then all of a sudden, in verse 5, he says, let this, hey, uh, have this attitude in yourselves. Wait a minute. Paul, did you just change directions we are supposed to be looking? Look at, the look at the first four verses. Is there any encouragement in Christ? Okay. Now the rest of them are, are the way I'm kind of looking at it, are characteristics of Jesus. That you and I are to have within us. But these are outward characteristics. But here he goes, look, he says, is there any encouragement in Christ? Is there any consolation of love? Any fellowship of the Spirit? Any 
affection and compassion. Then he says, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in the spirit, intent in one purpose, doing nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each one of you regard one another more important than himself. Wow. Tell me something. Does that describe Jesus to the core? All of those do, don't they? But they're a physical thing that you can see him doing. Like we were talking about Wednesday night, where it's him bringing the little child and, and having them in the midst. You can kind of see a difference in the child's attitude and in Jesus' attitude and the attitude of the people around him. You just kind of see a difference of what they saw. But now listen. He says Christianity is much more than just what you can see. Look what he says in verse 5. Have this attitude in yourself, which is also in Christ Jesus. Christianity must be much more than what I can see in you, but what God can see in me. My attitude, right? The way I do things. No, doing things is fantastic. But folks, that's on the physical realm. Now he's telling us to get on the spiritual realm. Jesus didn't do anything that wasn't based on a spiritual motivation. And here he is here telling us, have the same attitude in yourself which is also in Christ Jesus. But then he, say, he starts describing what Jesus did and what motivated what he did. Now in this process, when we're looking at this, folks, should this be the same motivation that guides us? I think so. I think so, especially the way that I'm, I'm kind of, I might be interpreting this completely out of the wrong way. Because remember, no scripture is a matter of private interpretation, Clayton. But here we go from here. Having this, have this attitude in yourself, which is also in Christ Jesus. Verse 6. I believe verse 5 is probably the key verse of all the book. Folks, you and I are to do much more than just the physical. Why do I do the physical? Is there any consolation and love? Is there any affection and compassion? Is there, do you see all those things? What Jesus did was based on what we understand goes and came from his heart. He didn't do anything that could not be seen coming straight from his heart. If you and I haven't developed that attitude yet, we've got some work to do, don't we? But listen to what he says. I believe this, verse 5, is probably the key from the rest of the book. Here he goes, Who, although he existed in the form of God, that's kind of an interesting word. Sometimes, no, no, we have to be careful. Sometimes when we, when we look at things, we're going to have to quit looking at the externals, such as maybe, oh, he, he offered such a pretty prayer. Or, boy, wasn't that a sober sermon from, from Rick this morning. Or, you know, the tenets of this congregation is tremendous. But folks, those are just outward signs of an attitude we're supposed to have within us. We've got to have this attitude. They're great. But you know what? Those things can be distracting, can't they? They can be almost confusing, almost hypocritical at times. Why am I here? If it's not based upon love for the Lord, love for my brethren, that makes a hypocrite out of me, doesn't it? I'm a play actor. And Paul says, hey, you developed the same attitude that Jesus did. He didn't do anything through hypocrisy. He did everything through love for you and for me, showing us the example of how to do it. Now, here we are. 
Develop this attitude. And he told us what that meant by that. Have the same attitude in yourself which was in Christ Jesus. Develop this attitude by looking at what Jesus' attitude was. Did he and the Father ever have a difference of opinion? No. I think if we saw Jesus in a, in a different way sometimes, it may help us understand him. There are a lot of people, even in today's world, that don't see Jesus as the second part of the Godhead. Here we are. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1.1. 1, 1. Boy. Before Jesus, now, verse 14, what does it say? And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The Word became flesh. Now, what was, what was the, the Word known as when it became flesh? What's that? Jesus. Mm -hmm. The angel came to Mary and Joseph and said, You shall have a son, you shall call his name Jesus. Right? For he shall save his people from their sins. That's pretty strong. So, when did the Word become Jesus? When he became flesh. Now, that's kind of what he's describing here a little bit. Taking on the form, it's his essential nature. What was, first of all, what was the word's essential nature? He was, John 1, 1, what was he? He was God. Excellent, excellent. That's what verse 7 and 8 says. But yes, excellent. Because he said, and look, here he was, although he existed in the nature of God, being God, he what? What did he do? He emptied himself. That's what the New American said. Another version? Humbled himself. Okay, we're going to get down to humble in the next word down. Of no reputation. Wow. But here he emptied himself of being on the equality with God. He knew that what God's plan was for him, he couldn't be God. He had to be man. Because he's going to be tempted in every way like you and I are tempted, yet... The Hebrew writer says, without sin. How can he be our perfect sacrifice if he was sinful? But he took on, in that realm, he was able to still keep his God form, but he had to take on man's form as well. Now listen to what he says. Start verse 7. But he emptied himself, taking the form of, now this time, the nature of a bondservant. The word he used there was not bondservant like we would think of, like a, maybe a, a ordinary worker in the Lord. No, he took on the word slave. Jesus took on the word slave. Now when he took slave, what does that mean? He took on everything that God wanted him to do. Here he is. A slave, a bondservant, 
and made himself in the likeness of man. He had to go through everything that you and I are going through. Hunger, anger, being tired, being hungry, sometimes being disappointed, hurting, but always remembering, I'm here serving my God. Yeah. And like Mark mentioned previously, and this is Terry too, she keeps repeating it. He was one of them, he united himself with God and he got me on here to die for us. And he didn't come back. See, there's a lot of things that Jesus could do that only God could do. And because of that, he didn't completely dissolve his form as God. Because he knew what his part of the plan was. Here the father says, let us save man. And let me tell you how we're going to do it. Jesus goes, or the word says, okay, I'll go down and I'll become a man and I'll die upon that cross. We're going to see that in just a few seconds. He said, yes, I'll take on not only the form of God now, but I'll take on the form of man too so that I can fulfill their every need. Now, how many of us would be willing to empty ourselves of what we are to become what God wants us to be? Folks, we do when we say I do. The day that you accept the day that you said, I need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of my sins was the day that you said, I am ready to take on the form of God in my life. Now, what did Jesus do? How did he learn obedience? By the things that he suffered. You mean Jesus had to suffer for you and me? Yeah. Jesus had to be tempted in every way like you and me? Yeah. But there's one very significant phrase that the Hebrew writer says, yet without sin. He never separated himself from God. Never. Woo! I wish I could say that. Wish I could say that. But here he is here. He's going, wow. Wow. Now can you understand a little bit better why Paul would say, we're in Philippians chapter 2. Why Paul would say, take, hey, in verse 5, have this attitude in yourself. Getting rid of things that would cause a hindrance for us. To take on God's divinity. All right, tell me something. When God bent down, made man out of, the, out of the clay, he blew life into him and made him a, what did he say? A living soul. You know what? That made him different than the rest of the things he created. Because you know what? He just put in man at that time, he put a soul in him. From the time of Adam and Eve until even today, we're eternal. A part of you will not die. Oh, this will, thank goodness. Boy, I tell you what, this will, thank goodness. But there's a part of me that's going to live forever, and the best part about it is I get to choose where I'm going. I get to make the choice of who I'm going to serve. Romans chapter 6, verses 17 and 18, right? But here I am. I get to choose who my master is. Wow. Wow. That's quite a, that's quite a, a, a situation, isn't it? But here he is here. He says, hey, you've got to take on this attitude that you're going to give yourself totally to God. 
Jesus never emptied himself of being totally committed to God. He just changed his appearance, his form. Here he was, God. He emptied himself of being of God, and he took on the form of man so that he can save you and me. So he can do the things that God could not do, and that was die. But Jesus had to, listen to what he says here, verse 8, being found in the appearance of God, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. I tell you what, that last, even death on a cross brings up a completely different idea. You and I have an appointment with death, don't we? Every one of us has that appointment, unless Jesus comes back first. But every one of us has that, that date prepared for us. But then what did it say? After death comes the judgment. I want to tell you something. I, I like my chances. I, I, I'm going to say this again. I know I've said it before, but I want to say it again. When I was baptized into Christ for the remission of my sins, Acts 2, verse 38, right? Baptized in Christ for the remission of my sins. What was I cleansed by? The blood of Christ. Now, that makes me pretty, pretty particular with Christ, doesn't it? I'm one of his offspring all of a sudden, right? But when will I have to die? You know, I was born with the Spirit of God. I was born with the soul of a man, of a person. I am now going to live for an eternity. It's like every one of you will. I know there are a lot of people who say, no, we're not. We're like we're over. We're dead all over. When we die, we're through. No. When we die, we just begin from the realm of a physical realm to a spiritual realm. And I'm looking forward to that day. I don't want to leave Kathy and the kids behind. Do you understand what I mean by that? I don't want to leave my family behind, but I'm looking forward to the day when I can go and, like what Paul said, be with the Lord, right? But here I am. I'm looking for that opportunity. But here he says, Jesus emptied himself in that form of being God. That word emptied, wow. That has a lot of connotation behind it, doesn't it? Most of the time you would say he humbled himself, but, but look what he said. He emptied himself, in verse 7, of, of, he emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. He, he had to drain God, the appearance, the form of God, out of his system so he can take on man's form. But did he ever quit being God? No. Only God could do some of the things that Jesus did. Only. But here he is here. Now in verse 8, and having been found in the appearance of man, here's what you and I, I don't know about you, but I have problems with these next two words. He humbled himself. Is there any difference between emptying and humbling? I don't think so. Dan? Uh, of his privilege, right.
Wow. Yeah, and imitate when we can. Yeah. Being God. Yeah. Right. See, now I think it's Roy. Yikes. Paraphrase what Dan says? I heard it, but I don't know if I can repeat it or not. But but he said what Jesus did when he humbled himself is that he did not empty himself with being God, but he just relinquished the privileges of being God. All the privileges that he had of being eternal, but he is still eternal. He took, you know, he, but he had several of the physical attributes of God. He could, he could raise the dead. He could do these miracles. But the thing is, he had to empty himself of being soul only, spirit only, so that he could be with us in kind of a roundabout way. Is that about what, basically what you're saying? But here he is, he emptied himself in such a way so that we can have a choice, can have a chance, of, you know, an, an opportunity of sharing the privileges that he gave up of being with God. But the thing is, he didn't ever really empty himself of being God. He just took on a different form. Um, here's rain. Rain comes out of the sky. It hits colder air down here, and it turns into snow. Is it still moisture? It just changed its form. You and I are to love God, humble ourselves with God, submit ourselves totally to God. We're still man, but our purpose and our attitude has changed. Does that make sense? My attitude must change if I'm going to have this same attitude that Jesus had. Because he was willing to do whatever the Father wanted him to do for us. Now, should I be willing to do whatever the Father wants me to do for you? And vice versa? Yeah. If we're going to have the mind of Christ, aren't we? If we're going to have this attitude. That's pretty strong, isn't it? But can you... Roy? Christ humbled himself. Oh, thank you. Christ humbled himself. And we're supposed to humble our, ourselves. Yeah. But how we don't have it's very hard for us to humble ourselves <laughs> as it would be for Christ to humble himself. But when he gave up all he had. Yeah. Can you imagine being on equality with God and giving all that up? Wow. Being God and giving all that up? Dan? Very good. Very good. He said he emptied himself of being on the privileges, you know, all those privileges he had of being God, but when you and I obey him by becoming Christians, we, bet we take on certain attributes. We take on certain abilities that we didn't have before. And now I can call myself a child of God. Couldn't say that before, but I can say it now. Why? Because Jesus adopted me into his family. Wow. Um, those of you who have adopted children... Do they have any different rights than your natural born children? They're exactly, in the eyes of the law, have the exact same privileges as your natural born children do. But there's only one difference. 
Jesus gets a double portion, you and I only get one. That's fine. That's why I get a portion. Isn't that right? But here we go. Here we go from here. Back down to eight. Being, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Do you, do you and I, are we, we going to have to do the same thing? Yeah, we're going to die. But in fact, folks, when I sinned, what's the consequences of sin? The wages of sin is death. I died spiritually. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Those of you who have Bible studies with me, you, get, you understand exactly what I'm doing right here. His hand is not short that it cannot save. His ear is not heavy that it cannot hear. But my iniquities have separated me from God. If I die in that separated state with God on this side of my sins, and I'm on this side of my sins, I'm in serious trouble, aren't I? I need to get rid of that barrier that separates me from God. What's the only thing that takes away sin? Revelation 1.5. Yes, sir. We are cleansed from our sins by his blood. Where do we contact that blood spiritually? When we're baptized, right there in that baptistry. Now, does it have to be in that baptistry? No, it can be in a lake, it can be in a river, it can be wherever there's enough water that you can be immersed. I'm using that baptistry as the illustration. What went in? A dead man, Romans 6, right? What went in? A dead man. I was dead. I was baptized into Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Do you, you get the simulation? Do you get the, how, how beautifully it fits together? Jesus had to go through a death. He, he humbled himself and did that. He had to take on death, he was buried, and he was raised. And when you and I realize that we're dead spiritually, and we're baptized into Christ, my dead man stays in there in the water, and I come up a new man walking in the newness of life. You see how all of a sudden a transition took place? Now with that transition, should I also change my attitude? That's hard to do sometimes, isn't it? Change the attitude, especially when you're, you're working with people that don't share that attitude, right? I can see you pulling in some truck stop somewhere and you hear anything but Christianity, I guarantee it. I have the same problem working down here in town. There's some little boys down there, pure filth out of their mouth. You, you've seen it. You know what I'm talking about. But, look what he says. I got to take on a different attitude. Now, when Jesus died, he said he is obedient even to the point of death. That could have been any kind of death. You know? But he even made it even more specifically. Death on the cross. Tell me, what was what did that symbolize, death on the cross, when it took for the, for the Jew? You couldn't have a worse death than that. Because what were you? You were hanging between man and God, made a spectacle. They did everything. Can you imagine the humi the, how he dehumanized him? You know, by making him strip and all that type of stuff. And they spit on him and they beat him and they put that crown of, of thorns on his head and they made him even carry his own cross but when he gave up Simon finish it up but when he got there they nailed him to that cross and he dropped him in that hole folks can you I, I can't imagine the pain he's going through at, and the way they're looking at you they could not be 
dehumanizing, insulting him more by, di by him dying on the cross. But he accepted that because he called it obeying God. Wow. Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ, yet not I that live, but Christ that lives in me. Every one of us, when we were baptized in that Christ, we were crucified with Christ. Isn't that what he said in Romans chapter 6? Yes. Haley? What Paul was saying. Yeah. yeah, what Paul was saying. For he that grew up before him, a tender plant, and the root of dry ground, he has no form of comeliness in which we see him. All that was taken away. The glory of God uh, was not revealed to, to them. There is, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men. He, you know, he suffered. A man's sorrow and acquainted with grief, he had, uh, as we hid, as we were, his face from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. He, uh, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem, esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. I, I, yeah. <laughs> that, that, puts, that puts a lot on me. Yes. <laughs> knowing, knowing that I did this to my God. Yeah. I forced God's hand in doing this for me. In essence, that's what, that's what he's saying. But listen, what was the result of all this? 9 through 11. 9 through 11. Therefore, I like that therefore. You want know to that therefore says to me? I'm concluding what I just started. This is by my summary. Therefore, also God highly exalted himself. Why? Why was he able to do that? Because he did everything that God wanted him to do. He emptied himself. He humbled himself. He even went to the point of dying on the cross. And what did God do? He exalted him. Wow. Okay. And he's going to tell you exactly what that means here. He exalted himself and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. And what is that? Jesus. Let's take it one step further. Jesus the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the one they've been, that Isaiah talked about. He is the one that... They've been talking about all through the Old Testament book. He is the one. He has a name greater than every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of those who are in heaven, on the earth, and under the earth, that every tongue should confess him. Wow. Confess him. That Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father, God the Father. When you and I submit ourselves to baptism, when we confess him as Lord, you know those five steps that we see every, every Lord's Day up here. When we do those, you know what we're doing? We're praising God. We're thanking him for the plan that he gave by sending us Jesus. That's pretty strong, isn't it? I don't know about you, but I'm standing up here right now and I got goosebumps. Thinking of what Jesus was willing to do for me. What he was willing to do for you. And when he did it, God raised him up to the point where there is no other greater than he. Now, the book of Revelation makes him, doesn't call him Jesus 
toward the end of the book, it does not call him Jesus anymore. It calls him again the Word of God. When, when he ascended to the Father, he gave up this fleshly being and he took back on his spiritual relationship with the Father. Now he is God again. Did you catch that circle? Isn't it exciting? And think, you and I have the opportunity because of what he did here in chapter chapter uh, 2, verses 5 through 11, we have the opportunity of being exalted the same way to be with him for an eternity. But you and I have that privilege of making that choice or not. Okay. Comment. people that said, oh, there's no God, we'll just die. They're going to be pretty interesting to see their faces once the, the judgment throne, you know, yeah. kind of judgment comes and they're like, okay, yeah, Jesus is, they're going to know immediately that Jesus is God. But can you imagine what they're going to be like, all those people who are out here in the world, who they think that they're fine, that when it comes time for judgment, they find out that they're not? That's sad, isn't it? Sad as it can be. I was raised, I want to tell you right now, I was raised as a denominationalist. I'm so thankful that I met this member of the Church of Christ. <laughs> you know? And her father happened to be a preacher. Well, he didn't ever sit down with me, but for nine months of sitting with her, he preached at me every Sunday. I said, No, you didn't. I said, I said, Yes, you did, Doyne. He said, No, you I didn't. I wasn't preaching just at you. Did you catch his gist? I wasn't preaching just at you. He said, you know how I know that you were preaching to me? You ought to see the pew in front of me where I stuck my fingers through the, through the, through the thing. Haley? Uh, I, I, I was just thinking about the uh, comment that was just made about the, the lost soul. Uh, some, some reject God don't want any part of that. True. Some are searching for God and not finding God. And that's our responsibility. That's why we send so much money to uh, the different missionaries. That's why we pay... Uh, this Gill ministry. Uh, 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 yeah. That's yes. why we work... Uh, and, and each of us has that responsibility to, to try to reach those that are seeking the, the law, uh, you know, seeking God. Mm -hmm. And and that's some of the prayers that we need to be constantly working on in our own life is that we come across those that are looking for God. Okay, now could, could he just said what Paul said here? Take on this attitude within you that's in Christ Jesus. We ought to be looking for those who are looking for him and be willing to even humble ourselves to teaching them about Jesus. Wow. You know, sadly, not everybody who's baptized is going to stay faithful. You and I can probably sit right now and think of people who are members of church who have fallen away. I can think of several. And sadly, every time you go to see them, you know what happens? The door is usually slammed in your face. They don't want the commitment that is necessary to humble yourself, to empty yourself, being in the image of Christ. They don't want to do that. But that's the only way they're going to make it there when we take on the attitude of Christ, where he was willing to do whatever the Father wanted him to do. Could that be for the summary of this little section here? Now tell me something. Is that any different than what he's been saying? No, he's just saying, we rely too much on the physical. Now let's get to the spiritual side of things, right? Wow. Okay. Anything else? Because he's about to ding-dong the bell again, if he hadn't already. Has he already rung it the second time? Okie doke. Yes, he did. I just heard it. We'll see you next week. You guys, hey, Rick, you and Terry and your dear wives, be careful. Be careful. We're going to miss you.